good to begin the week with you. My name is Mike Maxwell. I'm pastor here at New Life and I uh, want to celebrate just uh, several things with you. Um, yesterday we had movie night here and a um, great time together. Thanks to all of those who helped kind of pull that together and, and make that a, a fun time. And uh, for those who continue to help us enjoy just being together, enjoying uh, space and place and time together. Also, um, we are in a series called um, Seven Mile Miracle. We're going through this series uh, put out by Pastor Stephen Furtick of Elevation Church. And um, as we do this, there are just a few things I want to invite you to participate. We're on this journey um, kind of from Jerusalem to Emmaus, um, but we are on this journey towards Easter. And um, as we go through this journey, there are a few things I'd love for you to be involved in. One, worship. You're here today. Awesome job. Glad. Uh, make it uh, as often as you can every week, and if you're out of town, uh, check it out online, uh, and that would be great. A second way is to get involved in a life group uh, to discuss these kind of things in a little bit deeper way, and uh, you can find a list of those life groups uh, on the website, and uh, there are different times during the week, and um, you can choose the one that's uh, best for you, but we do have one that is kind of a, a beta. It's kind of a, a new test. It's an experiment, if you will, and it's an online group. And so if you're someone who's in a season of life where it's really hard to commit to one particular time on a regular basis, then this group might be for you. And uh, hopefully you'll try that out. A third way to kind of get involved beyond worship and getting in a life group is to engage in uh, a different discipline or a different spiritual activity that we highlight each week. So two weeks ago, we talked about confession and um, to try that out during the week. And last week, we talked about worship. Uh, have a time of worship, not just on Sunday, but in between Sundays as well as a regular part of life. And if you do each of these spiritual practices, we invite you to, on the website, log, hey, I walked that mile. Um, so that by the end of the journey, you might have walked all seven miles, or you might have tried all seven different um, spiritual activities. Um, so if you'll go online and, and mark that, then uh, we'll get to kind of ca uh, see and catalog how many miles our entire church has walked together as a family. And then the final one is uh, just to direct your attention to the back of the program or bulletin, where it talks about our Easter offering. The Easter offering is over and above our regular giving. And so often we will highlight some need uh, and people will take a uh, dollar a day for the 40 days of Lent and then bring that in on Easter as a special offering uh, or they're fast from a, uh, a drink or a soda or something during the week and save that money and bring it in on Easter. Um, but this year our, our offering is going to go to provide some hurricane relief from Hurricane Irma. And uh, we're sending a team to Florida um, come July, and we want to equip that team not only to go, but also to um, have funds for um, construction supplies, as well as to give as a gift for hurricane relief. So that's what our offering this uh, Easter is going to go to, and just wanted to kind of bring that to your attention as we head towards Easter. So today's a new day, and um, we're going to be talking about the importance of relationships and how we can serve one another. So I wonder if you would just in your mind just begin thinking about some of the most significant relationships you've had as you've journeyed through life. Maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a coach, maybe it was a teacher. I'm not sure who it is for you, but just have those folks in mind as we begin our day in worship. Would you stand with me and let's sing to God. Sweet peace 
Jesus rose in victory. We're alive. We're alive. We are free. Living in light eternally. Let's clap our hands to Jesus. I see the sun waking up in the morning, reviving dreams. I feel the wind on my back with promise, reminding me that there's a garment of praise for heaviness. There's a new song burning inside my chest. I'm living in the goodness that He brings. Let's sing this chorus together. Get your hopes up, lift your head up, let your faith arise. And get your hopes up, our God is for us, He's brought us back to life. Whoa. I see the sun, I see the sun waking up in the morning, reviving dreams. I feel the wind on my back with promise Reminding me That there's a garment of praise for heaviness There's a new song burning inside my chest I'm living in the goodness that He brings oh, Get your hopes up, lift your head up Let your faith arise Get your hopes up, our God is for us, He's brought us back to life. Get your hopes up, lift your head up, let your faith arise. Get your hopes up, our God is for us, He's brought us back to Sing Christ before me together. Christ before me, Christ behind me. I am firmly held in His mercy. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for being a God we can put our hopes in. Because we know we, we live in a broken world. We live in a world full of darkness and bitterness and evil. 
But God, even in the midst of all that, you've shown us beauty. You've shown us that you are working, that you're still in control. You've shown us that you have a plan. So we put our hope in you. We put our trust in you. We know and understand that in the end, your son Jesus is king. So God, in this week, we want to share the, the message that we have that you've given us, the, the reality that we live in every single day, that there is something in this world that is not of this world that we can put our hope in, that we can put our trust in. Give us the courage, Lord, when that opportunity arise to share that truth, that we would act, that we would respond. Give us the wisdom to navigate life, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, whether it's at school, wherever we may be. When we see an opportunity for us to share that message, let us have the wisdom to discern. Give us the words to say. God, we submit our lives to you. We, we, we submit our plans to you, our dreams to you. Whatever we may be doing, Lord God, we want to do it as unto you. Thank you for being an ever-present help. Thank you for being a father who watches us, who loves us. Thank you for being someone that we can call on and lean into. We pray for those in our church family who couldn't make it this morning, whether it's due to some sort of sickness or situation. There are new lifers who wanted to be here that couldn't be here. So God, we pray that the same presence, the same power, the same energy that we feel, your spirit will be where they're at. God, we pray for our community. We know that New Life Church was planted here for a reason, for a time, for a goal. God, we are just a corner, a little inch of your kingdom. So God, we pray that we would understand the role that we were meant to play here. That this community would see New Life Church as the light and we continue to be some, some place where the broken can go, where renewing can be found, that rest can be had. Thank you for that gift you've given us and you've given our community and the world. You're an awesome, amazing, great big God. And we can't believe that we get to stand in your presence, sing these songs, be amongst family and friends, and get to know you. Thank you for that opportunity. And God, let us <clears throat> pray as you taught, as Jesus taught his followers to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. I want to invite our kids ages kindergarten through fifth grade. You were dismissed for kids' worship. And uh, they are at the door. We're ready to receive you and to walk back with you to kids' worship. And um, they are learning about kindness, and then that is an action that, that ought to be on rewind or replayed. So uh, maybe ask them a little bit about what they learned as they come back or as you see them in the hall afterwards. Um, also, if you are here for the first time or whether you are a person who is here on a regular basis, hope that you'll take this um, connection card and you'll fill that out and uh, pop it in the... Uh, basket as it comes by in a little bit, and uh, we'll be careful to get you connected in, in ministry. Also, um, there are a couple of folks from our New Life family that I'd like you to continue to be praying for. Uh, you all are so faithful in praying all throughout the week, but these are some of our own. And uh, Mike Baumgartner had toe fusion surgery last week, so continue to pray for him. This will be somewhat of a lengthy process. Also, um, Amy uh, Marisi had her thyroid removed and yet is here today. Can't keep a good woman down. So it's good to see you. And uh, so we'll continue to pray for you and your recovery as well. Um, and then a word of thanks. Uh, well, actually, in yesterday, I was a part of a, a conference uh, in meeting with our bishop. And we were 
Uh, I was joined by clergy and um, church leaders uh, all over the Virginia area, and we're talking about uh, the issue of human sexuality in the United Methodist Church. And it was so great to be able to be a part of a conversation that's such a difficult topic, and yet people handled it with respect and, and with maturity. So continue to pray uh, for the United Methodist Church as we continue in these conversations. And then um, yesterday, uh, a deep level of gratitude to um, several folks who are here uh, to help us walk through an audit and uh, giving up their Saturday morning, which is, you know, not an easy thing to do in order to um, make sure that we are, are in good accounts. And I uh, do have good news to share that everything uh, that came in is accounted for, everything going out is accounted for. We are reconciled. And so, you know, good, good note there. Just thanks to those who use their gifts and their skills to uh, serve God through this church. And so we want to continue in our, our worship service, uh, giving to God. And um, as we do, I know that some of you all give weekly, some give monthly, some give uh, online, some give on, on Sunday. And uh, I just want to say thanks for the ways that you continue to give out of the resources God has given you so that God's ministries might continue. In addition to that, uh, during this time, we pray that it's not just a song to kind of get through, but that it be a song where you're, you're consistently thinking about, God, how have you gifted me? How have you wired me? The time that I have, the energy, the skills, the talents that I have, they're all yours. How do you want me to use them for your kingdom? So with that in mind, let's continue in our time of worship. Let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one. The one for whom you love and gave your sign for humanity. Increase my love. Help me to love with open arms like you do. A love that erases all the lines, sees the truth. Oh, that when they look in my eyes, they would see you. Even in just a smile, they would feel the Father's love. Oh, how you love us. From the homeless to the famous and in between. You formed us, you made us carefully Cause in the end, we're all your children Help me to love with open arms like you do A love that erases all the lines, sees the truth Oh, that when they look in my eyes, they would see you. Even in just a smile, they would feel the Father's love. Let all my life tell of who you are. And the wonder of your never-ending love. Let all my life tell of who you are. You're wonderful and such a good father. Let all my life tell of who you are. And the wonder of your never ending love. Let all my life tell of who you are. You're wonderful and such a good father. Let's all stand together. Let's sing that chorus. Help me to love with open arms like you do. 
I love that erases all the lines, sees the truth. Oh, that when they look in my eyes, they would see you, even in just a smile. They would feel the Father's love. God, you are so good to us. And we thank you for all that you have given us. So much more than we need or deserve. And you continue to pour blessing after blessing after blessing upon us. And your generosity is, is astounding. Thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Thank you for the people around us, and the people that you've brought into our lives. And Lord, we offer this portion which was yours to begin with, but we return it to you asking that others might experience your grace, your love, and your mercy. That joy and that comfort that come from being in relationship with you. And we pray all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Scripture this morning is from the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter, verses 17 to 27. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened it to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one place from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them, and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved, the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. The Word of God for the people of God. Well, my parents gave me uh, an amazing gift growing up. They showed up at just about every sporting event I was a part of. When I say every sporting event, I mean almost every sporting event. Almost every soccer game, almost every basketball game, almost every tennis match, almost every cross-country race, every track meet every swim meet, almost every marching band performance or show choir competition, whether it was raining, whether it was snowing, whether it was cold outside, or it was on, my parents showed up. And uh, I had two older sisters as well, and they went to those, uh, those events and activities as well. Are you picking up what I'm laying down? They were demonstrating the enormous gift of love by their presence, by just showing up, by just being there at these events. And um, they didn't quite have that gift, perhaps, when they were, were growing up, but they had made this decision, this con commitment to me and my sisters that this was something they were going to do for us, that they were going to be there and show up for us. And uh, I remember one soccer game. Um, I think I was a, a, high, a, a senior in high school. I, I know it was past the time I was able to drive, I got my license, and, um, and I had, uh, in one of my less than better moments, less than holy moments, I, I asked them not to show up. And um, I, I, you know, I was concerned about the ridicule of my friends because none of their parents were showing up 
And, and I just thought, okay, they're going to call me names. You know, your mommy and daddy still show up for your games, blah, blah, blah. And I was more concerned, I'm ashamed to say, more concerned about the ridicule of those other players than I was about disappointing my parents coming to the game. I figured they would, they would understand. So I asked them not to come, and they didn't, or so I thought. And um, so I, I'm at the game, and, uh, and I'm playing, and I just have this kind of heaviness on my heart, and I just felt awful because I couldn't believe I had asked them not to come. And then not only did I just feel bad about that, I, every time I looked into the, the, the bleachers, there was nobody there rooting me on. There was nobody there just cheering me on like they had always been there. And uh, it just laid to a, a different experience for that game for me. And, and I, I don't remember exactly, but I remember just feeling so bad that I must have just played awful that, that game. And so on the, the way home, I'm driving and I'm, I'm making this resolution in, in my head. I, I've got to just apologize, you know, for what I asked them kind of to do. I'm, I'm ashamed about that. And, and then I, I also, um, I, so that they don't have to ever do that again. And so I um, made this resolution. I'm going to make the apology, and so I walk in, and I said, Mom, I'm, I'm so sorry. And this is how I remember it. You can ask them later if they remember this at all, but uh, this is how I remember it. I said, Mom, I'm so, so uh, sorry I asked you and Dad not to, to come to the game. I just feel really bad about that, and she said, oh, that's okay, honey. We came and watched from the parking lot anyway. <laughs> Friends, that is standard Tom and Becky Maxwell, you know, came, parked in a, in a, a spot where they could see the field. Uh, they, they knew what had happened in the game. We talked about the, the game and, and uh, just moved on from there. But friends, this is a story not to get you to think or feel bad about times you may have missed an activity or a game. I've missed many for, for my children and, and wife as well. But, but it's a story to say, did you get the depth of love that my parents had demonstrated for me just by showing that's it. Because that, friends, is what love does. Love shows up. Turn to somebody next to you and say, love shows up. Turn to somebody on the other side and say, love shows up. And friends, this idea that love shows up is, is one of the things that's happening in this scripture passage on, on many, many different layers. Here is Jesus on the cross being humiliated and suffering to a great deal of agony and pain of what he's going through. Seems like he doesn't have a friend in the world. We've talked over the past couple of weeks that the, the you know, religious elite, they were, they were mocking him. The, the Roman guards, they were, they were throwing insults his way. The, the criminals even joined in the game. And the people, the crowd were in this as well. All the while, he is saving their souls literally dying that they might have life and that you and I might have life as well. Just when he could have said, you know, I'm going through all this and this is the thanks I get and kind of stepped away, Jesus starts to say things like, Father, forgive them. They really just don't have any idea of what they're doing. Or trusting in me, then today you will be in paradise. Jesus saying the sorts of things that, that perhaps you and I wouldn't be saying had we been in his shoes on the cross. But this is when love shows up. Seems like he doesn't have a friend in the world, but then John paints this picture of five people that just kind of stand out in the crowd from Jesus. For me, uh, I know this is kind of a weekly experience. For, for you all, maybe you've had that experience where you're searching the crowd for that familiar face and suddenly in the sea of people, they pop out. And for me, every Sunday, it's kind of my experience because I, I look through the crowd and I see some smiling faces. I see a lot of, you know, blank faces, but I see a lot of smiling faces. And I'm looking for one, though. I've got to be honest. I'm looking for one. And, and every week that face is in a different place and until I find my wife's face. And then I see that, that smile coming back. And I'm, okay, I'm on the right path. I haven't said anything embarrassing yet. All right. But, but that, it, it just changes things for me. And I can only imagine Jesus hanging on the cross in the midst of all this pain and suffering, looking out at all the jeering, the mocking, and the insults. 
and he's finding these five faces, and it just changes his perspective about how he's experiencing death on a cross. So these five faces in John chapter 19 are kind of listed for us. It's, it's uh, near the cross, Jesus stood who? His mother. And his mother's sister, and Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, or Mary of Magdala, and John the disciple whom Jesus loved. Or it's just the disciple whom Jesus loved. And you know later on we figure out that this is John and He's the one writing the story and doesn't want us to know his name, but, you know, really does. And that's a whole other sermon another time. But, but here is John and, and these four women. And uh, some commentators, they say that, you know what, it wasn't a really big risk or sacrifice for the women to be there because in that day and age and culture, women would have been uh, unimportant or unthreatening to um, the, the Romans and they wouldn't have seen this group of women as any threat of insurrection. And so they could come in and be a part of this picture and um, not really be at risk. But I would kind of disagree with that. And I would agree with the other commentators who would say that anytime you are associating yourself with someone who is dangerous enough for the Romans to say this leader is dangerous that we ought to crucify him, that's a dangerous scenario to associate yourself with that person. So I think there was risk for them being there. They were um, sacrificing not only what was going on that morning to be there for Jesus in his time of need, but they were seeing his pain, his suffering, his need more important than the own mockery that they might themselves experience. And they were willing to make that sacrifice, and so they were present. Because love shows up. That's just what love does. And so in this, this verse, we realize that Mary, Jesus' mother, is there. And she may not have understood all that's happening or going on with this crucifixion. At this time and in this place. And um, trying to figure out and put all the pieces. And the world may have seen this person as a criminal. But in her eyes, it was her son. And she, so she did what love does, which is what? It shows up. So she shows up, and Jesus sees her in the crowd. And then there's Jesus' mother, sister, which is not easy to say ten times fast. You can practice that at home, Jesus' mother, sister. But I think the important piece is, is trying to point out relationship here. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus', sis, Jesus mother, sister, which later on we know her name is Salome. This is the mother of James and John, the woman whom earlier we read Jesus had rebuked because she came to Jesus one day and she said, Jesus, you know, I want you to do something very special for me. I want you to give my sons, James and John, the places of prominence in your kingdom. Let them sit at the right and, and, and your left when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus very quickly and directly rebukes her and helps her to see the wrong in, in her uh, trying to be this ambitious. But we learn something very significant about both Salome and about Jesus in this counter. I mean, Salome having been rebuked, amazing to think that she's been rebuked and yet the act of love by just showing up and being there, she still took those steps to do that for Jesus it also tells us a lot about Jesus who is able somehow to be able to offer this rebuke but do it in such a way that she must have seen his love just shining through. That he was able to say the hard thing but she understood what was behind it. And so we see this picture of love. And then there was Mary from Magdala or Mary Magdalene. And this is the one whom Jesus had cast out seven demons and um, she had been forgiven so much. And so she had such a great depth of love because those of us who know if we've been forgiven much, then we tend to have much love. And she could never forget what Jesus had done for her. Talking about life transformation, that would be like an understatement when we're talking about Mary Magdalene and just the way she expressed love towards Jesus after that moment demonstrates what he had done for her. And then this beautiful thing happens that while Jesus is hanging on the cross, while he's in intense agony and anguish and pain, 
while the, the salvation of the world is somewhat hanging in the balance, Jesus, not thinking of himself, thinks of his mother and the loneliness she's going to experience after his death. And that he, as the oldest son, needs to provide for her. So in John chapter 19, verse 26 and 27, the story goes on to tell us that when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, read this with me, woman, here is your son. And then to the disciple, read this with me, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. What an amazing saying of Jesus while he's on the cross. Of all that Jesus could have been thinking about, his thoughts turned to his mother and what her needs were her. And he could have provided in many different ways. He, he could have turned um, the responsibility as oldest son over to his brothers, and yet he didn't. Because up to this point, they did not believe in him. They... Uh, had not thought that he was who he said he was. That would come later. But so at this point, he does something significant. He, he says, John, this is your mother. Mom, this is your son. There was already a strong bond and relationship there, but that just kind of solidified it even more. And, and those two, they, they were about to have a moment together while they're standing at the foot of the cross, and this one whom Jesus had a strong connection with, his cousin, was about to lose Jesus. And his mother, who had been there from the beginning, is about to lose her son as no parent should ever have to do. And they're going to have this moment, and there's going to be this emptiness. And Jesus knew that the best thing was for them to come together in a new and even deeper relationship was being formed. Jesus, in that moment, showed up for Mary. Showed up and demonstrated love because that's what love does. And they were able to comfort each other when he was gone. But that's not just what God does for others. That's what God does for you and I. God shows up. God has shown up and God will continue to show up for you and for me because in this, God demonstrated that relationship is critically important. It's of this primary quality to experience the fullness of life. From the very beginning, we read in, in, Gen in Genesis that in, in creation there was God and God is a social being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that in the fullness of God, there is love, but that love is best expressed in relationship with others. And so God didn't just satisfy God's self by remaining in, in heaven, all in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but in relationship to humanity. And so there comes Adam, and Adam incomplete without Eve. And so there's this joining together of Adam and Eve in this perfect expression of relationship of God with humanity and then with humanity among one another. The importance of relationships is huge. Jesus, well, before Jesus, the story of God's people is that God wants to dwell in their midst and, and all throughout the, the ages, the people of God kind of walk away from God and then they come back and they walk away from God and they kind of come back walk away from God and they come back until the point which is just in the right time Jesus dies on the cross and he dissolves this barrier between God and humanity and makes this relationship possible between God and humanity and he takes what might have been separation and he reconciles us. And he takes away shame and, and guilt that we've been talking about and he replaces it with grace the good stuff we don't deserve replaces it with mercy. You know, it's not getting the bad things that we do deserve because we deserve death from the ways that we fall short of what God intends and in the active and inactive things that we do and don't do in His name. God knew that we couldn't do it all on our own or for ourselves, and so He shows up. He shows up on the cross. Shows up on the cross for all of those who are 
going to ever accept this gift that he is offering, and he shows up even for those who won't. Friends, to me, that's astounding. There are hundreds and thousands and perhaps even more than that of people who will walk away from God and the gift he offers them, and yet Christ died for them, died for the world. Whether or not we would show up for God, God shows up for us So the question remains for you and for me, will we show up for God? God shows up because that's what love does, and the question becomes, will we show up for God because that's what love does? See, Jesus, will we accept the the relationship that God offers every day to us, and and will we live a life of love? Because essentially, Jesus is kind of down on one knee, making that proposal, seeing if we are going to accept. But if that's not manly enough for you, then maybe it's God uh, is offering to block for you in order that you might be able to make it further down the field. I don't, I'm not sure. Some of you have already accepted that relationship that God offers, and maybe there's just a different way to talk with others about it. But also maybe today is the day that you're ready to accept that relationship that God offers, that can grow in depth and meaning as we walk with God. And it begins today. If we're going to show up for God, you showed up for God today. Well done. You're here. The alarm clock did not win, right? Snooze button did not win. You are victorious. You have overcome. Well done. You are here. You are present. And oh, the heart of God must delight as he looks upon his star players who showed up to play on the game of life today, to come into this special and sacred place with other people seeking after him and to offer worship, reverence, honor, majesty, and glory to the one who is worthy. And it begins today, and it delights the heart of of God, but, but then, friends, it continues tomorrow because the way that we love God and live our lives in response to God is the way that we love others and we show up for others. So will you show up for others? Will you and I show up for others as a demonstration of our love for God? Sometimes the best way that uh, we can deal with our own pain is to help somebody with theirs. Because even in the midst of this cosmic battle that Jesus was engaged in, In the midst of his pain and his suffering, he turned his sights on others and he became selfless. And that's what love does. It shows up. You know, it's amazing to think, where would we be if it were not for the relationships God had sent into our lives? Take a moment and just kind of reflect and and perhaps maybe make a mental note of gratitude of the people that have come into your life and they've just had a positive impact and you are the person you are today because of that coach, because of that teacher, because of that neighbor, because of that parent, because of that you fill in the blank. Amazing gifts God has given us through relationships. And then flip it around a little bit and try and imagine where other people would be without you. It's a humbling thought, but God sent you into the lives of so many people, hoping that you would have the positive impact in their lives that he's had in yours. But where would we be without these relationships? And I just want us to think for a moment that you might be somebody else's answered prayer this week. Because relationships enable all sorts of things to happen in our lives. We can experience courage. We can experience strength where we didn't think we had it. We can experience purpose and direction and guidance. We can experience somebody who's willing to come alongside us and and cry with us when times are tough and celebrate with us when we've got something to be joyful about. That's the power of relationships, and God knew it from the very beginning. And he said, don't go through life without them. Some of us are ready to to have lots of different relationships and some are like, you know, you just give me one or two (laughs) and I'm good. But the reality is we cannot experience the fullness of God without engaging into those relationships. 
So friends, don't isolate and don't disengage, even if it is hard to engage. Otherwise, we won't experience the fullness God intends for us to experience. But there's a reality here in all of this, and that is that love shows up when people are in need. I've seen love show up when people are in need over and over and over and again, and I know that you have too. And uh, I've, I've seen it show up in this church quite regularly, and it, it's a blessing to kind of be able to be in, in my position to be able to watch it and see it happen. There's this group called Open Table, and, and it's a group of seven people at this church, and they, they made a commitment that um, they would be paired with a person who is, uh, let's say, under-resourced or not able to make um, some decisions without some guidance or... Um, Sometimes we take for granted the ability to make a budget or to uh, navigate certain uh, places of life. We have networks and relationships that help make certain uh, experiences possible. And we have lots of opportunities that other people don't have. And so this group in Open Table has partnered with this person to come alongside them to help them navigate life and help them take the next positive steps. This group of seven people is committed to meet every week with this individual. They could be doing a whole lot of other stuff with their time, but they choose to make this commitment that every week for a year, that's what they're going to do. They're going to show up. You know why? Because that's what love does. Love shows up. And then I've also seen it in, in other ways where um, on the mission field, let's say, right now, Kurt and Tracy Cooper over in Nizna, South Africa, and they woke up this morning on mission field, they showed up to where God was calling in their lives where they could be a blessing and a benefit to a, a group of young ladies and help them to navigate life where they could work with a group of young men and teach them carpentry skills and, and other kind of skills to earn a living and to advance themselves. They showed up because... That's what love does. Love shows up. I love how there's this, this team that, that's um, forming that's going to go to Florida. And in the midst of trying to help rebuild uh, all the devastation that happened from Hurricane Irma, one of the main messages they are carrying, regardless of what they accomplish, is to say that, hey, we, we've shown up as a physical representation that God loves you and God hasn't forgotten you because that's what love does. Love shows up. And then I also love how um, people gather around those who are sick or ill or have uh, lost a loved one. And, and uh, this Tuesday at 10 a.m. in the morning, there's going to be this group that's going to show up. Because many of you all know Nancy Von Schmidt as somebody of our, our family who we've been praying for for quite a bit. And some of you all haven't even met her and don't know her story. But in this most recent time, um, as she comes out of the hospital, her nutrition, which is feeding a tube, is going to uh, require like double the grocery bill, shall we say. And uh, the expenses for her residence are, are going to increase. And um, there's this group of kind of her inner circle that's just coming together to try and show up and find out what we need to do to kind of come alongside her. And friends, that's just what love does. It shows up. We might invite you all to be a part of that showing up too, but I don't know yet. We'll figure out the plan, see where we go from here. I love how um, it was at the beginning of January, uh, Ashley Pride, our, our family ministry director, was here and she talked about this vision and this hope for, for kids worship where kids would be able to be kind of further divided into age appropriate groups. But in order to do that, we needed some volunteers who were going to be able to on a regular basis be able to step into a place where the kids could count on seeing the same face on a regular basis. And that was going to be a significant thing in helping them to learn to love Jesus and learn to love others. And so many have uh, responded. We need some more, but many have responded so that we can have every other month uh, the commitment of a year where these uh, adults are, are saying, I'll be the one. You can count on me. I'll show up every Sunday. 
and I'll step in and I'll fill the gap. We have some youth who've done the same and they said, you can count on me every other month. I'll be that volunteer for the entire month so that these kids can have that consistency and a relationship can be built. Friends, do you know the statistics about youth is that if a youth has eight adults in their life that know something more than their name, then the likelihood of them remaining in church after graduation from high school, it just skyrockets. Which is both encouraging and discouraging to me at the same time. I think, wow, only eight people, only eight people, eight adults have to find a youth and say, you know, just, hey, what do you enjoy to do in your free time? Or what activities are you involved in? That's knowing something beyond the name, right? Only eight people. And it, it radically, dramatically affects their relationship with God post high school. That's a worthy investment. And yet the statistics are dismal of the student who graduates high school in their participation in the church in college and early adulthood. It drops off dramatically and it hurts because you think eight people couldn't find out something beyond the name of this student? What are we doing? Friends, love shows up when people are in need. So the challenge this week is to show up and serve somebody. So turn to somebody and say, show up. And turn to somebody on the other side and say, you got to serve somebody. So show up and serve somebody this week. Two weeks ago, we said, you know what? Um, confession is on the way to forgiveness. So if you'll spend time during the week in this activity of confession, then go on, online on our website and check I Walk That Mile. And you can go back and do it now. Last week, we talked about um, salvation. And we realized that you know once a person has received salvation, worship is going to be a piece of the life. Thanking God for who He is and what He's done in our lives. We just can't help but worship God. And if you spent some time outside of Sunday last week, go to that website and, and click. I walked that mile of worship last week. This week, it's serve. Find somebody somewhere and serve them somehow. Show up. Show up in, in their lives. Somebody's having a bad day. Show up. Offer them a a shoulder to cry on or, or a hug or a phone call or a written note. Somebody who is under-resourced, come alongside and consider the resources God has given you and, and see about transferring some of those resources to help them over a hump. Show up. Show up and for somebody who's sick or uh, had surgery or lost a loved one, y'all do great with cards and meals and well, keep showing up. Keep showing up. You might think it's a small thing, but I guarantee you the person on the receiving end is experiencing it as a huge act and display of love because you showed up in their lives and their time and their point of need. Show up and serve somebody this week. They may not understand the sacrifice of your love of what, you, what schedule you had to rearrange in order to, to make that meal and what you had to stop doing in order to deliver it or what you had to do in order to make sure it was happen. They may not understand, but show up and love them anyway. They may not um, appreciate the depth of what it took you, but show up and love them anyway. They may not be able to repay you to the level at which you were serving them, but show up and love them anyway. This week, show up and serve somebody because Jesus showed up and loved us this way. Jesus died for us while we were still sinners, and that demonstrates God's love for us. Friends, serving others, it, it takes sacrifice and it takes risk and it, it will take us becoming selfless. It's going to cost time, it's going to cost energy and it might cost money to serve somebody. But show up and serve somebody. So where will you show up this week? I want to put a little uh, challenge to you. When you show up, because I think you're going to show up in somebody's life this week, when you show up, look around 
and see if you don't see that God has already shown up. Because that's what love does. Love does what? It shows up. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the people that you've brought into our lives. Some we saw coming and, and we expected and, and we knew that we would meet them and we would encounter them, but other times we, we look back and we say, wow, that, that was a divine appointment, wasn't it? So God, we pray that you would help us to have eyes to see, eyes to see how you've shown up for us time and time and time again. Help us to receive that gift that you have done for us through Jesus Christ. To engage in that relationship. And to recognize that you are always there waiting for us to show up. So help us to spend time in, in confession and in worship with you. But also help us to show up in service of others to demonstrate our love of you. Because before we've ever served others... You served us. We're humbled by that. And we're grateful for that. We just learn, long to love others the way that you've loved us. So Lord, help us this week. Help us just to show up. Because that's what love does. And it's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we pray and all God's people said, amen. Would you stand with me as we sing our closing song?
us to the Father's heart. And though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the Lord's and He will never forsake His own. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. When the lies speak louder than the truth, remind me I belong to you. When I can't see past the dark of night, remind me you're always by my side. When the lies speak louder than the truth, remind me I belong to you. When I can't see past the dark of night, remind me you're always by. Oh, when the lies speak, when the lies speak louder than the truth, remind me I belong. Oh, when I can't see, when I can't see. Past the talk of night, remind me you're always by my side. You're by my side. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. Stumble, he will not let us fall. We are the Lord's, and he will never forsake his own. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. So friends, all week long, you're going to be showing up. You're going to be showing up all over the place. You're going to be showing up at work. You're going to be showing up at home. You're going to be showing up at the ball fields. You're going to be showing up at places where you enjoy to spend free time, if you know what that is. But you're going to be showing up all over the place. What I want us to do is change how we show up. When you show up, Show up and see if there isn't somebody around you that needs that, that hug or that word of assurance or encouragement that God perhaps has given you at a time of difficulty. And then show up and love them in that way that God is asking you to love them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go and show up. Why? Because that's what love does. Amen. Sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. And though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the Lord's, and He will never forsake His own. Signs, we are the daughters of God. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. Forsake 
his own we are the sons we are the daughters of 